chapter four of fuel of fire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fuel of fire by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter four mrs candy a husband even though a fool teaches far more than any boarding school the post of caretaker of baxon hall was filled by a worthy couple of the name of candy candy himself had been head gardener while the house was yet inhabited and he still pottered about the neglected old garden picking up a stick here and a weed there as the fancy took him his better half was a norfolk woman and had been wooed and won at cromer when candy was an undergardener at one of the big houses near that delightful town she always felt herself to be a stranger and a sojourner in mercer for she had left her heart with her two little children in overstrand churchyard amid the poppies which keep guard over the slumbers of them that await the great awakening within the sound of the blue north sea at least she had left half of her heart there the other half was filled to overflowing with respectful admiration of her lord and master who was the greatest and wisest man in the kingdom according to mrs candy it is a great satisfaction to every woman to have a final court of appeal for the settlement of all doubtful questions and it is a still greater satisfaction to be married to this court which blessing was mrs candy's in full measure it was a day in the early summer before the snowdrifts of may blossom had quite melted from off the hedges when nancy crossed the fields lying at the back of wayside and went through the iron gate into the lanes to her apparent surprise whom should she meet there but mr baxendale who strange to say had of late contracted a habit in common with the elder miss burton of perambulating nominally in search of exercise those particular lanes good afternoon said lawrence also trying to show a decorous amount of astonishment at finding nancy in the very place where he had come to look for her good afternoon i was just going to the post office explained nancy ignoring the impertinent fact that it took twice as long to go thither by the lanes as by the high road so was i exclaimed lawrence likewise ignoring the equally impertinent fact that he was walking in precisely the contrary direction but which of us who has learned anything at all has not discovered that very often the shortest way to a place takes us several miles in the opposite way county councils would compute distances more accurately than they do if they measured by companions instead of by milestones so lawrence turned with nancy and walked beside her which was the only sensible thing to do if he were really aiming at the post office he would never have reached it by his original route at least not without going right round the world after i have been to the post i want to walk up to baxendale to speak to mrs candy about something he continued won't you come with me it is a perfect afternoon for a walk all right agreed nancy she was a very obliging young woman i am always glad of an excuse to cultivate mrs candy or rather to let mrs candy cultivate me mrs candy certainly repays research doesn't she and i always make it my duty and my delight to research her to dig for knowledge out of mrs candy's stores is not an elaborate mining operation said lawrence dryly i never met a woman who found it so easy to begin talking and so difficult to stop i never try to stop her i feed upon every word she says but don't you want to put your own oar in sometimes miss burton i should have imagined that silence was hardly your favourite role oh i am not a great talker ah how appearances sometimes deceive murmured lawrence under his breath nancy laughed well not such a very great talker at least i have met greater ones once or twice so have i my dear mother for instance and the excellent mrs candy but that doesn't entirely exonerate you from the charge 
you are very rude indeed i'm not i'm exactly the reverse i don't know which is the greater my pleasure in the feats of great talkers or my wonder at how the dickens they do it then don't you find it easy to talk by no means you can't think how often i am on the verge of brain fever through scouring the hidden places of my mind for something to say and finding nothing poor thing now i never have to scour the hidden places of my mind for something to say so i should have supposed every drawer and cupboard in my mind is so full of remarks that it simply won't shut and the more i try to empty it by making the remarks the fuller it seems to get my envy of you even surpasses my admiration but i know why you find it difficult to talk remarked nancy thoughtfully it is because you are so reserved and reserve is the scourge of conversation ah i disapprove of reserve on principle continued nancy shaking her head reprovingly and i consider it your besetting sin lawrence smiled well then having diagnosed the complaint won't you prescribe the remedy there's no remedy except just not being it like nora and me you know i tell everybody everything i think and feel and that makes everybody comfortable and at home don't you know yes naturally it would have that effect and it makes people like you if you are unreserved added nancy wisely i've noticed that reserved people are never popular because they are always inviting you to a mental barmecide feast the dishes and plates are put before you with nothing on them and you have only to pretend to eat when you talk to reserved people there is all the outward show of actual conversation but the dishes and plates are really empty and it is all a sham that sounds very pretty but it depends a little does it not on the nature of your thoughts and feelings as to whether their publication would add to your popularity in your case no doubt it would but in mine i doubt it said the carpenter and shed a bitter tear indeed i put down any little popularity i may possess small enough it is goodness knows to the fact that people know so little of me the more they knew my sentiments the more they would dislike me i take it wherefore my reserve is perhaps as clever as your unreserve miss burton i can't pay it a higher compliment can i not a bit of it that just shows how ignorant you are if you are an angel and hide it nobody will be really fond of you i don't believe any one was ever really fond of an angel unawares angels unawares are esteemed but never loved and it is a most uninteresting part to play perhaps these short answers of mr baxendale's always irritated nancy as much as so good-tempered a young woman was capable of irritation she was never quite sure whether he was laughing at her or with her a most disquieting doubt neither as a matter of fact was he she could hardly be blamed for not understanding him when as yet he did not understand himself now on the contrary if you are a devil and say so she continued everybody will be charmed with you and think it is so sweet and dear of you to be so outspoken possibly if i had wings and covered them people would only say what a bad figure i had and how badly my clothes fitted but if i had a cloven foot and went barefoot everybody would smile and pity rather than blame and if i went to the length of putting my feet on the table the world would end by thinking them quite pretty and pointed toes would entirely go out of fashion which shows that truth like water no longer lies at the bottom of a well but is turned on to every house in an unlimited supply by certificated waterworks what an enlightened age we live in and how thankful we ought to be to the goodness and the grace which smiled upon our birth with so subtle a sense of humour again that sense of irritation crept over nancy but she refused to be balked by it and continued bravely all english people are too reserved it is the principal national fault so you think foreign nations have more attractive shop windows rather well you know how awfully difficult english girls are to talk to when first you are introduced i do by most bitter and most exhausted not to say exhausting experience well foreign girls aren't simply because they are less reserved i remember once when we were in london some mexican people came to call upon us who had had dealings with father in business and my heart sank when they were shown in as i hadn't an idea what to say to them 
even you yes even me it fell to my lot to talk to the daughter a very handsome girl so i began by asking have you any sisters a feeble opening but the best i could think of on the spur of the moment and what did she say oh she was delightful and nancy bubbled over with laughter at the remembrance she said yes i have two sisters and i will tell you all our love affairs and then you will feel that you know us thoroughly wasn't it killing charmingly so and what did she tell you in spite of all his resolutions not to grow too fond of her lawrence never could resist the temptation to bring the laughter into nancy's blue eyes she said in england you do not know how to love you are too cold and you have too much to interest you in mexico a woman has nothing to amuse her but to go to mass and to get married but in england you have so much to amuse you that you have not time to do either of these there is some truth in that declared lawrence there is then she went on now in mexico we do know how to love and we always love a man who has no money i said i had known cases of that kind even in england and nancy looked slyly at lawrence through her long eyelashes to see what effect this announcement had upon him but lawrence's heart was not within measurable distance of his sleeve so he inquired stolidly well and what did the mexican lady say to that she said but we are very bad in mexico and when we find that the man is so poor that we cannot marry him we fret and fret till we are quite ill and the doctor says to our parents that we shall die unless they give us the money to marry this man so then our parents give us the money and we marry him and are quite well a most satisfactory conclusion said lawrence piously and had the lady herself suffered in this fashion no but her sister had she told me my sister was like that till my parents did give her the money to marry the man she loved and now she writes to us that she used to have pains all over the body but that now she has not a single pain in any limb so they know how to manage their affairs in mexico don't they mr baxendale and again nancy looked through her eyelashes to discover the effect of this remark again lawrence was equal to the glance so it seems don't you think we'd better do the post-office on our way back suggested nancy after a few moments silent meditation upon the density of men in general and of lawrence in particular of course we had what a happy idea and now we can go straight to the hall by the lanes and up the park without getting the dust of the high road on our feet at all so the two young people threaded their way along the green by-roads and then across the undulating park till they reached the imposing front door which was crowned by the arms of the baxendales and as they went they talked by the way of all the trifling matters which are of no moment in themselves but are of such absorbing importance in the mouth of the one person whose prerogative it is to turn life's smallest coins into gold and earth's commonest corners into paradise mrs candy gave them a hearty welcome it was somewhat lonely up at baxendale hall and the worthy matron was truly thankful when any listener chanced to come her way i hope you enjoyed the village tea-meeting mrs candy said nancy after lawrence had transacted his business with his caretaker i thought you seemed to be having a good time mrs candy put her hands upon her hips and considered for a moment then she replied in the refined voice and with the clear-cut accent which are characteristic of all east anglians well miss burton i won't deceive ye when i comes into tetley schoolroom i spreads me hanky sure on my knees and i looks up to see what there was teat you consider the menu in short suggested lawrence precisely so sir replied mrs candy not in the least knowing what he meant and so agreeing with him all the more readily well when i looks up and sees nothing but mont cake and butter buns i says to myself says i the lord's will be done if i must be ill i must so i takes both i hope your resignation was rewarded said lawrence it were sir it were and how are you to-day after it all nancy asked mrs candy shook her head sadly miss very sadly it's wind in the head miss wind in the head and i'll tell you how that happened i was awaiting on mrs betts down at the ways two year come michaelmas and she was a paralytic if you remember miss i remember her quite well and i'm bound to confess i never knew any one get so much pleasure out of paralysis as she did she enjoyed to the full the minute description of every symptom well miss i was a-waitin on her 
and when she was a comin downstairs and a leanin on me her feet slipped and she dreve her elba into my side and that dreve the wind into my head so when i went to see to doctor he says to me says he my good woman says he you should have come to me when that first happened now says he i can't do nothing that there wind have got into your head he says and it'll never come down no never no more that's what t doctor says miss and that's what to matter with me nancy endeavoured to look as sympathetic as she was expected to look i am so sorry mrs candy it must be a most uncomfortable feeling it is indeed miss and my poor father was just the same wind in the head is in our family it is from living so near the sea and all them terrible gales and uncle willem was bad just the same too i remember when uncle willem was bad aunt selina she says to me lizzie says she i do wish as your uncle would go one way or t'other he do burn such a side of candle and me rubbing him up and down all the night with them imprecations did he finally recover asked lawrence politely not he sir not he recovering is not in our family replied mrs candy with slightly ruffled dignity and lawrence felt that he had made a mistake at ten i went to help aunt selina to nurse him i give him his medicine at two o'clock and he threw it up i give him his medicine at three o'clock and he threw it up give him his medicine at four o'clock and he threw it up at five o'clock he lay like a cabbage and at six o'clock he went off like a bird dear me how sad exclaimed lawrence while nancy looked out of the window to hide her emotion which unfortunately was not of the right sort and my children were just the same continued mrs candy inflated with the pride of race there wasn't one of em healthy not one and they all died afore they was turned five oh i am so sorry exclaimed nancy who was really sympathetic now how you must miss them i do miss i misses em and i wants em but i misses em more than i wants em they're a sight of trouble children are especially when they've wind in the head but candy looks strong enough suggested nancy by way of consolation he must be a comfort to you candy's spouse cheered up at once eh hey, he's a wonderful man candy is i never knew his like for eatin roly-poly puddin never since i was born t'other day mrs fairfax sent us a roly-poly puddin up from the ways and when we sits down to eat it candy says says he may the lord bless this here puddin to my soul and them as was the instigators of it and he eats it up every scrap eh hey, but he's a wonderful man candy is and he thinks a sight of puddin and has done ever since i first kept company with him a not inexplicable taste said lawrence i remember aunt he was ever so put out at a village dinner in tetley schoolroom twenty year ago come next christmas there was roly-poly puddin and candy got a good slice but would you believe it sir they give him his slice stark naked with not a scrap of jam nor even a syrup to cover it oh he was put about candy was and no wonder where did you first meet him nancy asked well he were a gardener at cromer hall when i was in service at overstrand i had lots of lovers in those days being as i was tall with a nice pink colour and candy he came courtin me and i suppose of all your lovers you liked him the best well miss i can't say exactly that there was several as i liked quite as well as he him never having been much of a one to look at then why did you finally choose him well miss though candy was never much of a one to look at i heard he was notable at cookin the notablest man at cookin in all them parts so i picked him and i keeps him up to it i can tell you lawrence smiled a most wise choice mrs candy i think of selecting a wife along the same lines but what did the rejected lovers do did they fling themselves and their broken hearts wholesale into the sea mrs candy bridled well sir only two days after i'd fixed on candy who should come a-courtin me but fison him that was coachman up at tall and a much finer man he was than candy being better set up all round then i suppose in true feminine fashion you rejected your choice and expressed your readiness to exchange the small bird in your hand for the larger one 
just emerging from the bush well sir i says to fison fison says i i'm real sorry as i can't keep company wi you you being such a fine well set up man all round but you've come a day too late i'm bespoke and how did fison take the blow well sir fison says says she lizzie he says i'm rare sorry as i've come too late but there's as good fish in the sea as ever came out of it and p'raps you won't mind looking out for a nice girl for me as there's no one as knows as well as you exactly what would suit me did you look out for one asked nancy i don't believe i should have done so in your place i think it is horrid when one's lovers falls in love with somebody else even if one hasn't cared for them but mrs candy was not made of such slight elements as nancy in course i did and found one just to his taste a bright girl she was peggy postern by name our sexton's daughter and one as had been the life of many a funeral in our parts eh but she was a merry girl peggy was and she attended every one of the funerals in overstrand churchyard i never knew such a girl for pleasure if there was anything going on she must be in it must peggy and she'd go to the poorest funeral rather than stay quietly at home half a loaf's better than no bread she used to say when i passed the remark that a funeral with no mourning coaches wasn't no better than no funeral at all miss postern seems to have been somewhat of a philosopher remarked mr baxendale but he had not time to say any more before mrs candy went on but i was a-tellin you about candy when he come courtin me he never would walk intimate with me arm in arm you knows because he said as it looked soft like to show as you was that gone on a woman and i thought it looked soft like for a woman to keep company with a man as wasn't that gone on her but i just made no fuss but bided my time it never will do no good to make a fuss with a man if you just waits and lets him have his own way he'll punish hisself in time and did candy punish himself he did miss for when we comes to a stile with nobody a-lookin on candy he says says he my lass he says i'll help you over this no says i if you won't walk intimate when folks is a-lookin and there's some credit in it you shan't help me over stiles when there's nobody by and i never let him not once till we was married though he went on his bended knees he did about it eh but he's a notable man is candy for hidin his feelings when folks is by and showin em when there ain't no credit to nobody nancy thoroughly sympathized with the speaker how awfully trying it would make me simply furious if i'd a husband that behaved like that it's tryin as you say miss but most things is tryin in this world and so they're meant to be for some wise purpose which we don't understand now and maybe never shall but it's the queer ways o men that give you something to think about when it's bad weather and you've no neighbours droppin in whiles why i'd as soon be an old maid with a stuffed canary bird as have a husband as was as easy to see through as another woman that's the beauty o married life you can never tell what your man'll do next nor what mischief he'll be up to no not even if you've got such a man as candy to deal with but you know as whatever he does it'll turn out for the best come upstairs said lawrence to nancy and have a look at the library i happen to have the key in my pocket do you always keep it locked up she asked as she followed him up the wide oak staircase yes always i don't want to have good mrs candy pottering about with a candle among all those priceless old books the house is insured for a hundred thousand pounds and the value lies chiefly in the library the rest of the furniture isn't worth much a hundred thousand pounds what a lot of money oh the library is worth far more in fact some of the prints and first editions are practically priceless i am strictly forbidden by my grandfather's will to sell a single book or print or to lessen the amount of the insurance but it seems a lot as you say and especially when i have to pay for it out of my already very limited income and then lawrence unlocked the massive oak door and spent a delightful hour in showing nancy some of his rare treasures i did not know you were so fond of old books he said as they walked home together oh i simply revel in them i should like to spend a month in that library and never put my nose out of doors the whole time if you would really like it i could let you have a key to the library and then you could go and sit there whenever you wished nancy's eyes sparkled with delight how sweet of you i should simply adore it then you shall have one with pleasure and i'll lend you a key of the house as well so that if mrs candy happens to be out and the house locked up you can still go in and up to the library 
only be careful to lock it all up again after ye oh i'll be careful awfully careful i promise then that's all right replied lawrence experiencing a thrill of delight at having it in his power to give nancy pleasure and he delivered the two keys into her hands that very day End of chapter four